Okay. How is this audio? Is this audio working now? <laughs> I'm getting a lot more response from the program. <laughs> okay. So you can hear me. Okay, so here's the funny thing. I'm using this webcam's microphone. <laughs> and I bought this in 2012 before I went to Korea. And I used this for the very first videos I ever made for the channel. <laughs> and I have this elaborate setup over here with my uh, fancy camera and fancy microphone. And I'm using this thing instead. <laughs> So, I remember last time when I did this and the reason why I didn't do it again was not just because it's very elaborate doing all the setup, but uh, I needed a microphone and I broke the microphone I was using. I dropped it on the ground and it just shattered. So, um, I tried doing the stream again, but with this external one and it didn't work. Now I remember. <laughs> oh, goodness. So, <laughs> apologies for the uh, blundering <laughs> this morning. <laughs> so, okay, I will probably need to solve yet another problem, uh, trying to figure out how to get this microphone stuff to work. I might just need to get an external one that I can plug into my, my laptop when I do my live streams. So, as I said at the beginning, I could not figure out how to get that um, weird blinking issue from the last from last week's live stream. Um, so I decided I'll just get this set up out with my um, digital camera and microphone and the lighting and the program. I got all that troubleshooted this morning, but I didn't check the audio, just the video. So. Apologies for that, but if you know how to solve the blinking problem I was having with the Galaxy S22, because I couldn't find any guides that said, you know, while you're streaming to YouTube with the Galaxy S22, you need to make this setting. And even though I, I looked this up after I got a suggestion from one of you guys, I still couldn't find the, the solution to the problem. So, I might, yeah, I might have... Uh, some issues with how I've got the setup going, but at least we've got a, a micro microwave, a microphone, uh, and then we can get underway. <laughs> so, thank you uh, to everyone who is here at the moment. I am going to get underway since we don't have too many updates um, from this week. Uh, I do have a few new bats that I made in anticipation of going to the guild, um, which I went to for the last time yesterday. 
Um, always, always bittersweet when you're saying goodbye to people that you've sat and spun with for hours um, over many years. But um, there is a spinning and weaving guild where we're moving uh, to in Siren Sester. So um, there will be, hopefully, some Saturdays I'll actually be able to go and spin with them. Although I might need a car. Um, yeah, there's no problem right now with the blinking because I'm not using my phone to do the stream. But if I want to do like quick streams, this is a lot easier to work with than like I've got five things sitting out just to make this stream happen today. And uh, I was hoping to be able to stream with my phone, especially when we're moving uh, and it's difficult to get all of the stuff set up. Um, but it might just have to be uh, like this uh, for a while. <laughs> um, okay, so <laughs> you guys could hear um, Layla. <laughs> oh, uh, so Karen um, has just announced that she's starting a, a spinning group. So that's fun, uh, especially when you're in an area where there aren't any. Um, having places to just go and sit and learn from each other or sometimes just being in a space where people are doing the same thing as you is really great because it kind of encourages you to kind of like buckle down and get going with the project especially if you kind of like delay and delay oh I'll do it tomorrow or oh, I don't know I want to do other stuff too or I don't want to do it alone <laughs> so um, yeah and do you you also sure sure shorn you've shorn all of your sheep now <laughs> so um yeah winning ribbons from your uh fleeces the sheep the sheep and the fleeces or just the sheep sounds really cool too um yeah so there's a, a fair number of you already um so last week Oh yeah, so that's pretty much the update. I've got new bats, and I've got a few spindles uh, left to list in the shop. I think I might have to put a hold on things because I'm going to have to crack on with actually getting everything packed up to move. <laughs> so, um, yeah, if there's anything that you sort of see in the shop, uh, either on Etsy or my website, um, you know, feel free to <laughs> help out <laughs> if you haven't already, and actually those who have helped out already, uh, I really appreciate um, the orders I've gotten this week because you don't think about this, especially when you don't move regularly and it's been a while since I've moved like every year. So um, when you're moving, you have a tendency to pack up things you need like your pots and pans. And when that happens, you sort of think, oh, actually now I got to think about all the meals I have to get out instead of cooking at home. And it's always cheaper to cook at home. So, <laughs> uh, I was very happy to have those orders and also the ones from uh, yesterday at the guild because, yeah, it's one of those things you just have a tendency to overlook that you're going to have to eat and it's going to be expensive. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Now, oop, what have we got caught here? Oh, I was going through some old bobbins and I found some yarn that I spun for my partner back in 2016. So I spun that up and, and um, got that uh, skeined and ready for probably deep storage until I figure out what I want to do with it. <laughs> so I've been trying to tie up loose ends today. So, okay, yeah, so you showed your, your ram and not the wool. I, I do have your sample of wool, if I can find it. Oh, yeah. Got it right here. So this is from uh, Karen's Sheep. So I've got this little sample here. And I've not been able to do anything with it because I've been finishing up with work and um, our housing situation, which was actually solved last week. Well, this week. Uh, so we went on to Siren Sester. It's my first time there on a Wednesday and managed to find an, a place for us to live. Uh, but we were really worried because we were on the train going down to see some places. And one of the people called us to say, 
Yeah, so one of the places you were booked in to look at is now no longer available. <laughs> so we're like, uh, <laughs> will we be able to find somewhere to live? So it was really quite stressful, but thankfully uh, we managed to find a place that is also cat friendly because there's no way we're going to give them up. I mean, especially Layla, she's too cute. Right now she's just rolling around on the ground <laughs> and licking herself. <laughs> Gosh, cats are so funny. Um, I have not been able to put the new spindles on the website yet because uh, the other ones sold out completely uh, this week, which, like I said, I was very grateful for. Um, and I haven't been able to list the other ones yet. So I need to, I finished test spinning them and they're great. Um, but I haven't actually photographed them and I don't know if I'll have time to do that today. So it'll probably be something I'll do tomorrow. Um, and how fast before I leave? <laughs> so we're actually moving, um, September, uh, 4th. It's a Sunday. So what I'm doing now, uh, with this camera, you might actually get better detail than what I had with my, um, uh, this better camera than I had with my other camera. So... If you just let me know if you can see this all right. But basically what I've done, oh, I didn't even show you. So I've got this. So this is um, the silk I spun this morning. And um, I made it a little thinner than this yarn here, which is a little thicker. So this is that um, bat that uh, I'd had in my shop for a while and no one wanted to buy it and I, it felt like it was really lonely. So I decided to spin it up and um, I also thought, well, why not do kind of like a slight art yarn with that? And so the, the easiest way to make an art yarn is to spin up a bat because it's usually like the bats that I I make usually have a lot of texture and a lot of different colors and so um, when you spin it it can kind of naturally have these variations in it and what we're looking for is something a bit like this when you ply a, a yarn with a thinner yarn so it's basically an unbalanced uh, two ply then um, you kind of get like this little bumpy effect. Hopefully you can see that. Maybe, well, the goal is to then list this back in the shop to see if anybody um, wants uh, this bat plied, it's like spun and plied rather than just as a bat. <laughs> Because <laughs> sometimes I forget this, there are a lot of knitters and crocheters and weavers out there, especially in comparison to spinners. So maybe the person who really wanted this bat wasn't a spinner. <laughs> okay, so you said it's a little fuzzy, but you can see it. It's difficult to get the... Um, the viewer to focus on the right thing but I might I might adjust the camera in a little bit so that you can see the, the bobbin though it's got to be a little bit careful I have to be careful with it because it might just uh, dislodge and kill the stream because it's got um, a USB uh, micro mini or uh, was it mini I forget which one it was plugged into it so um, it's, it's a bit delicate right now. <laughs> yeah, so this, when I was uh, first starting to spin, this is the type of yarn I loved making because it's, it's really, um, the, the bat itself, because it naturally lends itself to having some thicker spots, um, 
this was my way of making art yarn more consistently. So I have skeins of yarn in my stash that have this um, imbalanced two ply two ply style because I got really really obsessed with it. So I made so many yarns that were like that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's pretty much what we're doing today with this yarn and then I'll show you the final result because usually with plying it doesn't take too long um, yeah sometimes you just need to make contact with uh, people just randomly talking about stuff so um, you probably remember from the live or the um, tour de fleece stuff that I posted that I'm helping a friend to make a corset, and I was talking to a lady in our guild yesterday, and she said, "Oh yeah, I used to teach a bra making class when I was younger," and I was like, "Really? That's so cool!" And so yeah, sometimes just talking to people, you find out all kinds of cool and potentially quite relevant stuff. Oh, that's a good point, Sonia. When moving, have a suitcase at hand for all that last minute stuff. That is very true. I mean, I initially came to this country with just a couple of suitcases of clothing, and that was it. So one of the things that we're very excited about with this um, particular move is we're going from a furnished apartment to an unfurnished one. So when you don't have any furniture and you're on limited funds, like I was, it was kind of important to have a furnished apartment. But now that we've kind of establish ourselves a bit more, it's kind of, I want my own furniture. <laughs> At least for the storage concerns, because um, the furniture here is really good if you don't do a lot of craft business stuff, but if you do a lot of craft business, it, it needs more sensible storage options. So uh, one of the things we're going to buy right away is a bed. <laughs> But yeah, we, we don't even own a bed right now. <laughs> Mindy said that there was only one spinner at their meeting and the rest were knitters. I found that kind of interesting. Um, at our group, there are a lot of people who are spinners and knitters and some, some of the ladies will kind of oscillate what they bring in so sometimes they will just bring in knitting for the day or they'll just do some spinning um we have one person who pretty much is just a weaver um but i would say that most of the spinners do lots of other things but we do have an occasional spinner who just spins for the love of spinning so I guess I, kind of, I, I guess I find that a little bit odd, but it probably isn't. There's probably a lot of other groups out there that have um, that kind of dynamic. Yeah. Also, until you find more local guilds, uh, I am happy to have you on these days. <laughs> Because uh, I don't know um, what the future has in store for me, and even though there's a technically local Spinners and Weavers Guild we're moving to, it actually might not be feasible for me to go at first because they meet in like 20 miles from where I'm living, and it's not easy to get around through um, that particular area. It's the Cotswolds. So I'm probably going to need a car, and unless someone is nearby and also willing to take me, <laughs> I, 
I might be doing live streams on Sundays uh, with my virtual guild. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, that sounds like a cool thing. Like we should come up with a, a title for our our virtual guild here. That would be fun, right? <laughs> a knitter is a spinner, and Weaver who has not branched out yet. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Okay, so years ago, the Fiber Guild combined the Knitter's Guild, and um, the Knitter's Guild kind of won out. That's, yeah, I see that, um, especially with the revival of knitting, particularly um, in that sort of 2000s range. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if we get a lot more spinners because of the pandemic. Because there's, there's definitely been a lot of um, new people getting into the craft uh, that I've seen recently. And a lot of channels uh, that do fiber arts have been growing, like, hugely. So if any of you also watch Evie from Jillian Eve, her channel has kind of exploded uh, of late. Like... <laughs> When I first started chatting with her about uh, doing collaborations and things, I think she had like 12,000 subscribers and now she's got like over 30,000. So there's definitely... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's Layla, let you know she's here. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I really think that in the future you're going to have more um, spinners coming into these guilds. Because they'll be like, what's around me that's um, kind of fiber crafts focused and you'll get more people um, coming in to spin. I find that spinning is so therapeutic. It got me through really the, the most difficult time in my 20s. So I was working full time and I was doing my master's degree, my first master's degree and I was teaching martial arts four days a week, and I was conscious of the need to get more income so that I could pay back student loans. I was also looking for a second job in addition to the arguably two I already had. <laughs> so um, I would just need to calm down from all the stuff that I was going through and Spinning was a saving grace for my sanity. <laughs> okay. Only Spinner was in her 30s. Everyone else was above retirement age. Yeah. <laughs> Layla said hi. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's, there's definitely a lot of things going on in the comment section that I can commiserate with. So the Spinners and Weavers Guild that I was part of uh, back in the US, there was probably a good array of different fiber arts interests. So I wouldn't say it was like mostly spinners or knitters or weavers or anything else. I think it was, oh, and we even had a fair number of felters in that group. Uh, and some one lady who was really great at silk painting, um, but yeah, there weren't a lot that were closer in age to me because I was only twenty five <laughs> when I joined, <laughs> and it was it wasn't as difficult for me because I actually enjoy being around older people because they have. A wealth of knowledge just from having lived a lot longer than me and given that they are doing a craft that I'm already interested in it was very easy to just shut up and listen <laughs> to what they were saying and doing um, but I think you're kind of just naturally going to find that but I hope that in the future there will be increasingly more young people uh, joining guilds Cause I know there are tons of young people out there because you just do like a quick YouTube search for knitting podcasts and there 
a whole age range, like young people probably in their 20s all the way up to older people who um, know YouTube like the back of their hand, like more so than me. Um, so yeah, I think hopefully with the, the pandemic and people needing creative outlets and ways to like slow down life, um, there will be more um, people around in general who do this stuff, so more local guilds starting and um, a greater demographic distribution of people who engage with it. So if you don't have young people coming in as the older generation gets older, you sort of get these gaps in knowledge. And it's difficult because you don't, you don't want to see that happen, but at the same time it happens regardless. So the continuation of these kinds of skills is really important for the future. Um, Yeah, knitting, knitting during the pandemic. Oh yes, and weaving. I told myself when I first started knitting, I'm like, I can't see myself being a little old lady with a spinning wheel out on the porch. <laughs> and I said that in in jest because I, you know, even then I knew that <laughs> not just old people do that, but it was just. <laughs> Oh, how little you know. <laughs> um, but I also told myself once I got into spinning more, I wanted to spin to knit rather than do anything else. But I definitely find weaving fits really perfectly in the whole spinning, knitting, weaving circle. So, um, like I said uh, earlier, I've got this yarn that I spun for my partner because he wanted a hat, mittens, and scarf combo. I managed to actually make him two scarves. One that was woven and the other one was knitted. Um, but I had a tiny bit left over, so there's probably not enough for anything to, to make with it. So in that case, it's going to be probably woven into something. <laughs> So it kind of helps with finding a way to use up those last little bits of yarn. And then um, I put on uh, my Instagram a little photo tutorial. When you are weaving an end to your knitting projects, or if you just have like small scraps of yarn like this long, something else that you can do is you can cut, cut them smaller if you need to. You just card them with some hand cards or on your drum carter. Um, you can also throw them on your blending board and use that as texture for the next yarn that you're going to spin. So, you know, apart from the obvious stuff like, um, you know, bits of debris that make their way into fleeces, you really don't have any waste when you make yarn <laughs> and then obviously use it subsequently <laughs> oh no um crafts at fox cottage sounds really really cool um not in the the east midlands are you <laughs> we were walking home from the pub last night to celebrate a friend's birthday and uh, we saw some foxes on the way leaving, which is actually kind of early because they usually don't come out until later. <laughs> yes. Oh yeah. Um, Sonia said she started knitting when she quit smoking. And then... Um, yeah, thinking of things to do when you retire. I mean, I don't know if I'll actually ever be able to retire, to be honest. Um, I feel like just having graduated again for the final time, there's there's a lot of work I need to do still, and I don't know um, if I'll be able to retire anytime soon because of that. <laughs> I took the, the slow approach, I guess. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, so I bought my wheel just as locked on started. I'm also a knitter with the delusion of a weaver. It's still in its case. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, I sometimes feel like that with some of my other tools because I don't have as much time as I would like in order to um, make uh, Rolex with my blending board just because with the drum carter it's so much faster for me. But I can't quite um, get sort of the color effects with the drum carter as I can with a blending board. And I also have a hackle which I needed a better table for because the table that I have, I can't get the hooks in deep enough so that it stays secure. So I want to do more hand pulled rovings, but a lot of the stuff is just time consuming and right now I'm, I'm always a little bit short on time. So I just, I need to sit down and, well, stand up, <laughs> sit down and make time to do these uh, methods of preparation. So I totally get that whole, that whole point. <laughs> um, so Mindy said, outside my county there is a greater variety of crafters. And uh, I get the whole idea, you don't want to drive that far. <laughs> um, yeah, oh, what fiber festival, Mindy, are you talking about? She said uh, she would like to find younger volunteers to help out with the fiber festival that uh, she works with. So you actually might be able to find some people around um, through this stream, if you let us know. <laughs> um, yes, that was probably one of the good things about the pandemic is a lot more people exploring their creative potential and finding new uh, hobbies that kind of help them get centered. Definitely, 100% agree with that. I also think the pandemic has made us more sympathetic to each other, uh, which I think is only a good thing as well. Um, we do, yes, we, we do need to know old skills. One of the things that I'm starting to find now is I write, I write everything in cursive and there are some people who, who just genuinely can't read cursive handwriting anymore. And when I was in grade school, we were, we had handwriting classes. So you had to, well, you learned all the letters the uppercase and the lowercase, and she had to go home and practice all that. And teachers uh, from that grade onward often wrote in cursive. It wasn't really until I got into the later years of high school when a lot of teachers just stopped um, writing in cursive for all of their lectures. And that was also with the chalkboard. And you probably, like, you probably remember they had those like grids that they would put on the board with the, the big heavy top bottom line and then the smaller line to show how the height of all the letters and everything. But yeah, there, there are loads of people that I end up just having to print for uh, so that uh, they can read my handwriting. And you know, that's also good for lots of other reasons as well. But, um, the reason why I prefer to continue writing cursive is it's very creative and flowing way of writing. And even when I used to print everything, I would loop letters together anyway because it just has that really natural flow. But to me, I feel like that's one of those skills that is going to become lost if we don't keep practicing it. Um, oh yeah, so Mindy, you've got some really great ideas there. So she said, I was thinking of doing an activity next year where I could have people plying together short bits of scrap yarns to make funky art yarns. I think I mentioned something like this on a live stream, maybe a couple months ago. Uh, <laughs> 
Yes, spinning and walking is a really good thing. So when I was uh, writing my PhD thesis, one of the things I looked at was uh, tool deposition. And during the British Iron Age, people are doing weird stuff, especially to human bodies. So like sometimes you'll find a pit and it's just somebody's arm. Like it's a human person. It's just like their arm. No, no other bits of their body or even evidence that the rest of the body was there. Um, and it's sometimes put there with other stuff. And as an archeologist, it's really difficult to sort of interpret what this might have meant, like why they might have done it. Uh, Cause to us, it seems really unusual, right? So I kind of took a similar approach with textile tools in most archeological reports, it's just considered, oh, well they were done with it, so they threw it away. But in my research, I often found that there were, there were too many that were perfectly, you know, still usable and everything, but were thrown away. And yes, you could make an argument that, oh, maybe they were clearing things away, but it was happening in too many different, like, sections of, of sites and time periods to make that a really good argument. So what I found through my investigation is that I think sometimes people are treating textile tools with some kind of reverence. And um, so I get through this entire deposition study where I'm like looking at the way people discard stuff. And another site that was part of my sample study, there was a spindle whorl found in a ditch that surrounded this particular settlement. And it was a very small settlement. And through this research that I had done, it didn't have any um, other indications of a deliberate placement, right? Like thrown away with purpose. And... I genuinely think it was because someone had a spindle and they were walking around near the outskirts of this property and maybe they just lost the spindle <laughs> and because the study area I looked at it's not uh, conducive to preservation of things like wood it probably had a wooden shaft and so given the way that it was put into the ground, I'm pretty sure that this was like an accident. And so I have this lovely image in my head of someone walking around with a spindle whirl, like a spindle, right? And they've lost it <laughs> in this ditch during the Iron Age. <laughs> so uh, Mindy says it's the Great Lakes Fiber Festival. So that's um, up north. Uh, which state specifically? Yes, using uh, loom waste uh, in other projects, brilliant. I also sometimes use loom waste whenever I um, wrap up my bats for you guys. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, so Sonia has also done a fair amount of walking and spinning. <laughs> yes, oh. That's actually a really good idea, because I mean, in the past, I'm pretty sure that in, in most societies where everything is done by hand, you would have a lot more visibility of hand spinning um, as a craft. So if that, if that means just getting more people to, to join in, making more friends, then yes, by all means. <laughs> I should probably do that more, but I often work from home, so I can't. <laughs> I'll have to motivate myself to get out. <laughs> um, Karen says, loom waste is great for tapestry weaving, which um, I don't really know much about tapestry weaving. It's one of those things where I kind of like put it on the docket. Maybe I'll learn this sometime, and then I don't. <laughs> oh, 
goodness. Sonia. <laughs> my handwriting, cursive, and print was so bad that one of my teachers in high school made me do calligraphy. That sounds like such a fun punishment, though. <laughs> I took a, a calligraphy course. It was like a summer session. I think we met for three hours a day over the course of six or eight weeks. Um, just like once a week. I actually went with my neighbor because um, I think she was semi-retired and needed something to do but wanted to do it with somebody and my parents saw this as a great opportunity for uh, them to not have to pay for a babysitter. <laughs> so she took, so we, we went down to um, this place together um, and learned calligraphy. And that actually probably did improve my handwriting now, now that you mention it. <laughs> so, I have met the end of my silk, which I actually didn't anticipate. So, all I'm going to do now uh, to tie these together is I like to make a little knot. And so, this yarn is now done. And I have a bit left on uh, this bobbin, which I'll probably just maybe chain ply it and use it for another project. But this is going to be a little mini skein here. So the silk that I use is kind of, is mostly white, but there was also some bits of uh, blue. But I don't think you'll be able to see the blue against against um, the rest of it. So that's that's what we managed to do today. Quite proud of that. So there's probably like, I don't know, 30 or 40 yards of this. And we've got a little bit left over here. So like I said, I'll probably just apply this on itself just to get rid of that last little bit. And I'll probably just use that for wrapping up bats, maybe. <laughs> I always need yarn for things like that, and I never have like dedicated yarn or string to use for that purpose. I pretty much just use whatever I've got. Um, so, yeah. Let's see here, what else? They've, they've stopped teaching cursive in your area, Mindy. Oh, wow. So, yeah, I guess... Well, back in the day, people would sometimes just sign with an X because, unfortunately, they were illiterate. So you learn this, actually, in school. Um, probably learned it in history history class, um, but being able to sign your name and have a unique signature that is for you and difficult to replicate unless someone is trying to steal your identity, I, I hadn't really thought of it from that particular angle, but needing to practice your calligraphy or your cursive so that you can sign your name for your driver's license or something. <laughs> Wow, okay. Okay, so Mindy is um, in Ohio, so that's where the uh, Fiber Festival was she was talking about. Um, Eureka, Montana? That is Montana, right? MT. <laughs> oh, yes, of course, you're, you're from Montana. <laughs> oh, no, you bought a second spinning wheel. <laughs> Uh, I sadly have to sell mine, so I've got my Kronsky here, but then I also have an Ashford with a bulky um, bobbin flyer attachment on it, because where we're moving to is slightly smaller than this place, and there's no attic storage um, and no closets, so that's pretty typical um, of the UK, especially if you're moving into an older home, uh, which this one was built in 1879, and it was a manor house. Uh, formerly. Not anymore. <laughs> I'm not going to live in a manor house. I'm not that kind of rich. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, so I have to uh, find a new home for that. And um, we didn't have anyone new to the guild yesterday, so I'm going to have to list it probably on uh, Facebook and or eBay. Um, so... Okay, Chris, I received a bat of yours with the thinnest applied thread tying it up. I aspire to spin that thin. <laughs> Honestly, it's sometimes to my detriment because I am so controlling of the yarn that I make that I unfortunately take some of the beauty out of the yarn. Um, so yesterday we had a couple of people who are getting the certificate of spinning and they talked a little bit about what the program is, and what they have to do for it, uh, what it's like in terms of personal challenges, and um, some of the yarns that they showed uh, were beautiful. And the reason why was because they still maintained a lot of the character, the essence of the wool they were using. And sometimes when I get super duper in control of what I'm spinning, I sort of overlook the natural beauty of the wool. It's like it's like hammering a piece of metal into shape. I don't want to always do that. So um, it's nice to know that I can if I wanted to make something that would be a commercial style yarn. Um, but hopefully when I actually finish editing this uh, v-neck sweater pattern recipe, I'll uh, do another version with a slightly more rustic looking uh, hand spun um, just to show that it looks beautiful with these perfectly made yarns and those that are not perfectly made like they're perfect in their uh, they are perfect in the sense that they more reflect the wool than just the control over the wool <laughs> if that makes sense <laughs> oh man so, a button and string activity next year. Oh, um, what is it? Dorset button making? Uh, our guild is going to do one next week, or next month, and of course I'm going to miss it. But making dorset buttons sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, there's, there's another dyer from the UK called Abercairn Yarns. She makes them too, and they're, like, whenever she posts them on Instagram, I'm like, woo! <laughs> <laughs> hi Maureen sorry I've been really bad about not saying hi to everybody today <laughs> yeah non-uniform in thickness is, is what I mean because sometimes it's just like sometimes when you are making like roll lags or you're making uh, carded bats they're the shorter fibers and they just naturally make a little bit of a, a thick spot in the yarn. And my tendency throughout my spinning history has always been to like untwist and smooth out those bits, which is probably what spinners in the, in the days prior to um, mechanical spinning machines um, would be interested in making because they would then use those yarns for weaving and um, typically you would want nice even yarns so that for consistency sake you can actually weave something that um, was balanced and it wouldn't cause warp breakages and things like that so you know from that point of view it was important that the yarns were as perfectly even as possible but uh, since we still use quite a lot of um, machine made stuff today um, it makes sense to kind of let some of that perfectionism go and just embrace the uniqueness of hand spun without it sounding like it's bad. <laughs> so. <laughs> Art yarn is, is lovely and one of the things I've talked to um, other spinners before is like how do you reclaim some of those earlier yarns that you've made before you sort of manage to get really consistent yarns 
to switch hands. And so maybe one of these live streams, we're going to spin left-handed. <laughs> um, let's see here. I spent years spinning thread. It was soothing to me, but not useful. One of the things that would be really cool to do is a spinning challenge with silk. So uh, for this ply, um, I just did a pretty basic um, from uh, the combed top preparation, it was mulberry silk. And so I spun it kind of like a typewriter as best as I could. Although it's kind of a, a thinner top combed top than um, say like tessa silk or even wool. So um, I didn't get kind of like that typewriter effect with the silk, but I learned uh, yesterday that the amount of sheen that you get from silk differs depending on how you spin it. So it would be fun to do kind of like a silk challenge to see if we can actually see that in the yarn. So comparing them. Uh, so I could probably like spin it on the live stream and then do sort of a follow-up video when um, I can actually examine them better and obviously film it. So that might be something to do. Um, thanks for stopping by, Karen. Um, yeah, so what should we do for next week? I That is the last Sunday before we move. And obviously I'm not going to be doing a live stream when we were actually moving. So I'll have to think of uh, what to do for the following week or so, because we're also going to be packing and doing all that stuff on our end and then unpacking on the other end. Uh, so it'll probably be a little bit uh, longer than I want. Um, so yeah, so give me some topic ideas uh, that you might be interested in. Um, I do have some Shetland that I could spin on the stream. So it was one of the bits that I wasn't able to spin for Tour de Fleece. Um, but I carded it up because it was this last remnant um, from a former guild member. And uh, she sadly was unable to continue spinning. I think it was like a, a carpal tunnel thing. So um, she just kind of gave away some wool for donations. And then, um, you know, I kind of want to do some justice to this last bit of Shetland. And I know that I have not actually done a fiber talk episode with Shetland. Um, I kind of stayed away from it because it seemed really complicated for me. And now that I'm living in the UK and I've experienced a couple of different types of Shetland, I feel more confident in talking about it now. Um, so we could do that. We can talk about uh, Shetland uh, while we spin that next week. Um, yeah. And we may, we might then also talk about spinning consistent yarns with bats. So this bat I'm talking about has a lot of texture in it. So um, I'm looking at it, but I can't actually get to it because it's in a, a storage tote. <laughs> Um, but yeah, there's a lot of texture in it, and I have done um, this one here, which it's not full of a ton of texture. So this is that little bat that we spun last week. Yeah, so there's there's some texture in it, but not a whole lot. So what I could do is just talk through my particular process when I'm spinning a bat that has a lot of texture, but I need it to be spun quite consistently for a project. Um, something kind of like if you're going to use it for lace, which is one of the things I thought about doing with this is making some kind of um, hand knitted lace thing, like a, like a scarf or uh, maybe another shawl. I've got enough shawls. <laughs> maybe another scarf. <laughs> Um, but regardless, uh, we could, uh, do that for next week. Um, I, I probably will be more silent, uh, than I am right now 
in terms of putting out content, but I do have a backlog of videos that I've been editing. So I'm hoping that uh, I'll be able to minimize the disruption on your end by just having those videos ready to go and then I can just release them and watch them during the premieres with you guys. So that's another uh, thing that we could do. Um, oh yes, the place that I'm moving into is beautiful. <laughs> And it has a dryer, which we're really excited about because in in the UK, it's not common to have a dryer. And some places may or may not have a washing machine. Uh, and it's really difficult to find a place that has also a dishwasher. So we have um, sort of increased our ability to do laundry more efficiently instead of having clothes laying around all the time. Uh, so it's the little things <laughs> that just <laughs> make you ridiculously happy. <laughs> so a dryer. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, in terms of the place, it's, it's really nice inside and because it's been converted into a series of flats, when we walked into the place, they, they said, there's a lot of character here. And I looked around and it's the kind of place where you couldn't get furniture before going to see it because there's a good chance your furniture just won't fit. <laughs> but there's sort of like this um, little opening area that has windows on either side. And I thought that, that could be a really good place to um, do some spinning and other kinds of stuff, uh, fibery, fibery related, fibery related. Um, there's also another window area that I was thinking of uh, potentially having everything set up, and it would be wonderful to have some natural lighting because in this house, it's a terrace house and there isn't a whole lot in terms of lighting, and we've got all the rooms are blocked off by walls. So this new place we're moving to is kind of like an open floor plan, apart from the bedrooms. So it might just be, um, you know, the Instagram worthy house I've always wanted to live in. <laughs> um, yeah, so Shetland, we might, we might just do Shetland. And I do have a lot of Icelandic, so I keep going back to this idea of, ooh, I want to spend the Icelandic I have, but I'm also aware of the fact that I want to make it into something, like a bigger project, but I don't know what. And so because I can't decide on the project, I don't want to spin it. <laughs> and I don't want to spin it just for sampling because I can't get more of it. And I have considerable amount, so I could make a large project, so I need to have a project in mind before I do sampling with it so that the sampling that I do makes sense for the project I'm intending it for. <laughs> um, yeah, let's see here. Yeah, so I, I can schedule um, the release of videos in the future, which is what I've started to do ever since I restructured my schedule uh, on the back end of the uh, Tour de Fleece. So um, I'm more consistent with my uploads. Um, although this past week was a little bit difficult because I had one entire work day where I couldn't do much because we were um, traveling to look at places to live. Um, but I should have a Fiber Talk episode coming out next week. Um, the best of Expertly Died, uh, that, that's, that's kind of an interesting idea. Um, I might be able to do some short videos, kind of like I did for Tour de Fleece, to sort of include you in what it's like packing up, um, my Fiber Studio, um, and other things. Also, what I, I'm still working on behind the scenes, so, um, that might be something I could do like a couple of times a week. Um, let's see here. Oh, 
Well, Mindy, we have a VOD, so those are video on demand. As soon as the live stream is over, the video is available online. So even if you miss being here for the live stream, uh, you're more than welcome to watch it whenever uh, is convenient for you. So don't worry, don't worry about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> not miss me so much. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. I definitely am going to be scheduling some content so that there will be some releases coming out. Um, so, yeah, I, I filmed a lot actually before my mom got here because I knew I wasn't going to be able to do a whole lot of filming while she was here and I was also doing it before all of the Tour de Fleece filming I was going to have to do. So there will be some uh, longer videos that I put out, um, probably like at least the 10 minute mark. Um, but I, I think the idea of like doing a couple of update videos as well might be kind of fun as well. Um, a top-down vest so that you can make it as long as you have yarn. Yeah, so um, this is sort of the idea that I had with um, the v-neck sweater and uh, I'll talk a little bit once that's actually formatted and I've got the, the pictures of the sweater uh, finalized, um, I still have to do a little bit of the weaving in of the ends, which is never fun. Um, so once I have that, I'll kind of go in depth into ways to like figure out how much yardage you might need based on a knitted swatch and the weight of it. And this is actually, for those of you who, who follow Ply Magazine, uh, JC just mentioned something related to this. So um, if you're curious, go check out Ply, one of the videos or the reels that they've put out, uh, kind of give you a hint of what I'm talking about. Uh, that way you can anticipate if you might run out of yarn uh, for a particular project. Um, so yeah, because it's always tricky with hands fun. <laughs> um, yeah, and to be honest, when I was in high school, vests were really, really cool. So they, I think it was part of like that British academic kind of look that's sort of making its way around again, you know, 20 years later. <laughs> so that could be fun. Um, again, I was never really successful making sweaters when I first started knitting. Um, but being a spinner, I think has improved my understanding of the way yarn works. So I will be better at making clothing in the future. Um, and then I also have my hand spun sweater project to get on with. So I might dye that yarn and film myself, uh, just so that I can post another update about that project because September is around the corner and I still haven't finished my crafting New Year's resolution this year. <laughs> So I need to get on with that. <laughs> anyway. Oh, goodness. Okay. Thank you, uh, Jennifer, for joining the stream. Um, okay. So next week, going to do some spinning with Shetland and talking about how to uh, sort of smooth out any kind of inconsistencies in textured bats so that it fits a gauge a little bit better because um, it's even if you don't want to do that it's good to have practice doing it so that if you have to in the future you have the skills developed um, so I'll show you that uh, especially since I'm quite good at it <laughs> um, and then I'll give you some other updates about um, like stuff that I can put in the shop. I will try to get those bats and the spindles into the shop. Um, I'll try to delay packing up my carter and, and um, accoutrement as much as possible. Because uh, I've got other stuff that I don't use as regularly, like, you know, my PhD stuff. Um, I'm not going to be using uh, for a little while now. I put the wrong thing on here. Um, then I might be able to get a little bit more uh, posted to the shop because it's it's probably going to be a couple of weeks once we get to our new place before I'll still before I'll be able to start um, making any uh, fiber or like dyeing anything. So yeah. 
Anyway, so it's been really lovely uh, sitting here chatting with you guys. Sorry about the initial uh, hiccup with the microphone. Again, I, I, I'll probably just have to get an extra little microphone and then plug it into my laptop. Uh, that way I'm not using this little guy. <laughs> An old webcam. <laughs> um, hi, Michelle. Thank you for, for joining the stream. Sorry that I'm going to be wrapping it up here in a second. Um, yeah, and if there's anything throughout the week, uh, any other ideas you come up with, I need to get back to replying to you guys uh, in the comments. So some people have said some things and I've not been able to get back to you guys uh, timely. Um, but yeah, so um, just stay tuned to the socials, so if you check out the description below, uh, you'll find ways of staying in contact with me, and I will do my best to promote information uh, on those platforms as I can, although today was a little bit uh, different because I only got it figured out by around lunchtime, <laughs> so it was a bit late getting that going, but next time, um, having worked out more of the bugs this time around, it should be more smooth. <laughs> anyway, so have a good Sunday, guys. I'll see you next week. Bye.